come from? The sun. The planets. Our home, the Earth. What triggered their creation? I went on the hunt for rare evidence. Where are we? <laughs> that's been dropping from the sky. Got something. It sounds really big. And it's pointing to a cosmic birth more violent than we ever imagined. Also, life. It's been around for billions of years. But how did it begin? You know what you want to make, but you don't have a recipe. For decades, we've been trying to cook up the building blocks of life in the lab and recreate the origins of it all. But the parts didn't seem to fit together until now. We were the guys who stood back and looked at it in a different way. One team may have retraced a key step in the birth of life itself. How did they do it? And what about us and our origins? They say some of the hairiest questions in human evolution could be solved by these guys. Head lice. E. Lice have been with us and evolving with us for as long as we have existed. See, right there? Oh. Now come straight out. Oh my goodness, oh if my goodness. you want to hit the red alarm button at school, all you have to say is the word lice. These tiny bloodsuckers are rewriting human history. We cannot neglect the lice. Also, where does your identity come from? Your memory, of course. My memories define me. This brain researcher made a major discovery about how memories are formed and even how they can be erased. You can wipe out who you are, and that's an alarming thing. All that and more on this episode of Nova Science Now. Funding for Nova Science Now is provided by... Where did we come from? How did we get here? Our history in the cosmos and on planet Earth was shaped by countless events. Some obviously epic, some seemingly trivial, yet all vital in getting us to this point, here and now, the people we are today. One of the reasons we're here, that we exist at all, is that Earth, cosmically speaking, is in a relatively peaceful place orbiting our sun in a near-perfect circle. Our cosmic neighborhood has granted life billions of years to evolve, mostly undisturbed. But where did this stable piece of real estate come from? We know that stars and planets, once upon a time, all started out like this, with enormous clouds of gas and dust. How we got from here to here, we haven't exactly figured out yet. But lately, we've found some intriguing new evidence that tells us our peaceful solar system may have started with a violent event. If we want to unlock the secret behind the origin of our sun and its planets, it would be helpful to find some remnants from the birth itself, an event that took place about four and a half billion years ago. Luckily, there are some rocks left over from our earliest days. Asteroids, formed during our solar system's birth. Occasionally, some of them drop in on Earth. And when they do, they're called meteorites. I've come to the deserts of Arizona to try to track down some rare space rocks. Where are we? <laughs> Perfect place for hunting for meteorites. Southern yeah. Arizona, look at this. Couldn't ask for a better place. It's an open desert, it's an old lake bed, and so the sand is being blown away like right now, and it's exposing the rocks that are on the ground. And it's just so, you're just looking for something that looks a little bit different. And you'll know it when you see it. Well, I'm from the city, so all this looks different. <laughs> I'll be hauling everything back for you. <laughs> so how do you spot a meteorite? Well, sometimes the signs are hard to miss. Some leave deep impacts in Earth, like one that blasted Arizona's Barringer Crater 50,000 years ago. But most leave less obvious traces. They can be as small as dice 
reduced to a rocky cinder. Then, they have to be distinguished from Earth's rocks. One trait stands out in nearly all meteorites, metal. They've got it. So the best way to find a meteorite is to hear it first. No question about that one. And we can pick as far out. Ruben Garcia brought along some samples and showed me why a metal detector is the meteorite hunter's best friend. It's what meteorite hunters call a halo. Mm -hmm. You don't have to swing over the meteorite. Yeah. You get in that halo area and you hear the sound going up. You get in the zone. We like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is very typical as meteorites go. This is called an ordinary chondrite, and, and about 82% of all meteorites that fall are going to be of that variety. Chondrites are rocky meteorites that haven't melted completely. That's what we want to find. There's more. <laughs> We've actually got what we call meteorite canes, and this is what These are I golf clubs, about. I know. This, this, this is a golf... <laughs> this is a golf club with a very strong, in this case, two very strong magnets attached. Go ahead and test, test it, it, it with the okay. cane mm -hmm. and see what you got. Yes! Go. Music to my ears. I have found a meteorite. You okay. certainly have. I keep this one. We found it. <laughs> are you guys ready to find some meteorites? Let's go find Let's some. Go do it. Hunting for meteorites is like trying to find a pebble on miles of beach. One of the graduate students has found something. Watch the cactus. Oh, thank you. It sounds really big. <laughs> oh, there it is. Piece of farm equipment. That is your first meteor wrong. Congratulations. Meteor wrong. Meteor wrong. But I want a meteor right. So all we do is fan out now and just We just fan out. And just, uh, this just, is a whole area here. It could be anywhere. You got something. This has no characteristics of a meteorite. Hmm. This meteorite hunting is a lot harder than it looks. And some days, you don't find any. So they told me this was the remains of a meteorite hunter that came out unprepared. This is one of those days. Don't tell them what you find out here. Luckily, over the years, hunters have turned up more than 30,000 specimens. The largest, at around 60 tons, landed in Africa 80,000 years ago. Some of the rarest are pieces of the moon, blasted here after impacts there. But one of the coolest things about meteorites is that most were formed four and a half billion years ago, during the birth of our solar system. When, for reasons not yet known, a cloud of gas and dust transformed into a sun with circling planets. So can these space rocks tell us what triggered the event? Here at Arizona State's Center for Meteorite Studies, its director, Minnie Wadwa, Come on in. is trying to decipher our cosmic past. So here you will gown up to go into the clean lab. Protective clothing prevents contamination from foreign particles. Inside, Wadwa breaks down meteorites in search of their chemical birth certificate. After crushing and dissolving them in acid, she can identify the atoms and molecules inside. The results? This four and a half billion year old meteorite is laced with a special kind of atom called nickel 60. Nickel 60 is interesting for us because it is the decay product, the daughter of iron 60. And iron 60 is really what we're after. Nickel 60 is created when another atom, iron 60, decays through radioactivity. That number 60 tells you how many protons and neutrons are in an atom's nucleus. So when this rock formed four and a half billion years ago, it was originally infused with iron 60. And iron 60 is created in only one place, a supernova. A supernova is the violent, destructive explosion that marks the death of a massive star. 
So that means when these meteorites were forming from a gas cloud during the birth of our solar system, the gas cloud had been sprinkled with iron 60 from an exploding supernova. We're interested in iron 60 because it may be injected by a supernova nearby. Right before we were right all born. Right before the solar system was born. But wait a minute. A supernova is one of the most powerful explosions in the universe. It's so luminous, it can be seen across billions of light years. It releases as much energy in an instant as our sun will produce over its 10 billion year lifetime. So how could a baby solar system survive such a violent, destructive event? Well, turns out, some researchers think the reason we survived is that the supernova explosion was actually the trigger that created our solar system in the first place. The one question that we're trying to understand right now is, could such a supernova actually have been involved in the formation of our own solar system? Alan Boss is one astrophysicist convinced that we owe our existence to a supernova. He thinks it happened like this. Like everything else in the universe, we started out as a cloud of gas and dust. Then, a distant massive star died and went supernova, sending a shockwave toward us. When the wave of pressure hit the cloud, it collapsed and condensed, starting a chain of events that led to the formation of our sun. You can think of it kind of like a snowplow. You can create mounds of snow or destroy them. We can do either or. So you are the supernova of the ski slope. That's for sure. As the plow pushes through a parking lot of light, fluffy snow, the snow clumps together in bigger and bigger chunks. Out in space, pressure hitting a gas cloud has a similar effect, except Instead of snowballs, you get stars. Once you've got the makings of a star, gravity draws leftover gas and dust into a giant swirling disk. The dust continues to stick together, clumping into rocky asteroids, which eventually become orbiting rocky planets. And voila, a solar system. So is this where we came from? Well, not everybody's buying the supernova as a creator theory. What remains a little bit controversial about that idea is that you can't have that fluffy cloud near the supernova. When that shock wave is just coming out of the explosion. supernova explosion, it's super strong. For Steve Desch, a supernova hitting a gas cloud is more likely to do this. Like a snowplow in overdrive, a supernova shockwave might sweep away any gas clouds in its path. Desch thinks something gentler triggered the collapse. A shock driven by radiation from a massive star. But Alan Boss has crunched the numbers and insists that at the right distance, a supernova shockwave would be transformed from a destroyer into a creator. We believe that our own solar system was a cloud sitting there in space, more or less minding its own business, when a supernova shockwave struck the cloud and have it collapse down and form a new star system. We still don't know for sure what the trigger was. But since we've discovered meteorites with supernova dust, we do know that a violent explosion rocked our cosmic neighborhood at the time of our birth. And it's quite possible that without it, our stable, stately solar system would never exist at all.
One of the most significant events in our distant past is still perhaps the greatest mystery, the origins of life itself. How did it all get started? If you look down the evolutionary tree of life, you'll see that we mammals branched from reptiles, which branched from fish, and so on and so on, all the way down to the base of the tree. A common ancestor, some single-celled organism billions of years ago. But what came before that? And where did the very first living thing come from? Correspondent Chad Cohen digs down deep into the roots of the tree and uncovers some groundbreaking research into how life first began. Everything on Earth that has ever lived came from an ancient ancestor billions of years ago. Perhaps a simple, single-celled organism like this. But from where did it come? From where did the first life emerge? Life emerged from chemistry. <laughs> it's, then it's, after that, it's just details, right? So at the root of the tree of life, it appears, is chemistry. Simple elements like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. But how did they get cooked together into the complex molecules of life? We're here on the planet, and we must be here as a result of organic chemistry. John Sutherland from the University of Manchester, England, along with co-authors Matt Pauner and Beatrice Gerland. Beatrice Gerland? Gerland. OK. He and his team took on the task of looking for the holy grail of life. You know what you want to make, but you don't have a recipe. We can all imagine what this is like. In the kitchen, we bring together different ingredients all the time to make all kinds of different things. It's the recipe, though, that makes it all work. Take, for example, the cream puff. Oh, yeah, pot a choux. OK, pot a choux, as it's known in French. In this case, I know the ingredients. Flour, eggs, milk, water, butter. What I don't know is the recipe. So I might just try mixing all these things together. and baking them. I could try different orders, different combinations, different amounts. But what you get is not pot of choux. Too brittle, too hard, too, well, I have no idea. Attempts to find the recipe for early life were unsuccessful too even though researchers knew the basic ingredients. Yeah, exactly. Nobel laureate Jack Shostak and his team at Massachusetts General Hospital say that early life needed two things. You need the cell membrane. I can take something to live in and keep other things out. And you need some genetic material, something that can allow the inheritance of information. Every modern creature uses DNA to do that. It's an organism's instruction manual, genetic code, spelled out in chemicals inside this twisty double helix. DNA has long been hailed as the fundamental molecule of life. We also have RNA as well, usually described as DNA's helper. But now, it turns out, RNA has a starring role. Years ago, RNA was kind of a, a bit player in the cell. Now our picture is completely inverted. and We think RNA is really the important thing. RNA has a genetic code also written with chemicals. A, C, G, and U. They're used to help build the proteins that make up the cells in our bodies. Skin, hair, brain cells, the heart. RNA helps make them all. So what's the recipe for RNA? It's made from three parts. A sugar, a phosphate, and a single letter of the genetic code, a base. Each of these parts is made up of simple chemicals that existed on the early Earth. But nobody has been able to put them together. That is, until John Sutherland came along. We were the guys who stood back and, and looked at it in a different way. It's one thing to make chemicals in the lab, but there were no labs on the early Earth. So Sutherland tried to replicate the conditions. In some ways, simulate what that Earth would have been like. Simulate the actual chemistry that took place. Starting with their version of what Charles Darwin suggested as the perfect spot for the source of life, a warm little pond. The pond itself is actually the little round bottom flask. 
And because it was a warm little pond... It's around about the temperature of a, a cup of English tea. Sounds nice. And so they tackled the problem at hand, trying to make RNA. Knowing what chemicals it would take, the question was how to cook them together. People have known the ingredients for some time now, but the recipe has not been really working out. You actually have to be the person that writes the recipe book. So that means we have to go back to the kitchen and try to combine our ingredients for pot of choux in a new way. Remember the ingredients. Eggs, milk, flour, water, and butter. We combined them before with no luck. But now we have a real chef to help us. Well, you had the right ingredients. Right. But you forgot one very important step. It's that intermediate step. Chef Richard Coppage of the Culinary Institute of America explains that I was missing an all-important intermediate step. You didn't pre-cook the mixture. I can't just mix these things together and bake it. No, actually... because that's why you have this. So pre-cooks. What does it mean to pre-cook something? Some of the ingredients need to be cooked together first. This is the intermediate step. That you didn't do earlier. Yeah. I first cook the water, milk, butter, and flour together. No eggs. Then... Take it to the mixer. Now you can add the eggs. OK, now, finally, OK. And you get just the right mixture. All right, that's ready to be baked. The result... Wow, they look perfect. Without that intermediate step of pre-cooking, you really don't have pas de choux. It's not much of anything without that intermediate pre-cooking step. Great. And apparently, that was the problem scientists were having with RNA, trying to cook all the parts together. And that's not the way to do it. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so Sutherland's team took their own intermediate step. First, they created a hybrid made of a sugar and only half of the base, the part that holds the genetic code. This intermediate substance came together in the flask through the simple process of evaporation. It looks like a smear or a smudge on the inside of the flask. On the early Earth, the intermediate would have formed through evaporation, made its way up into the atmosphere, and then fallen from the sky. And so this would come down in rain, or if the temperature was cold, it would precipitate out as solid particles and fall to the ground, almost like a kind of organic snow. And as in the lab, meeting up with the remaining chemicals in perhaps another warm little pond and attaching together in the final step. And it worked. For the first time, scientists created a building block of RNA, what's called a ribonucleotide, containing the base C. In hindsight, pretty simple. It never occurred to me to try putting them together in a different order, <laughs> so it was not obvious. It was, in fact, an amazing accomplishment. Because if you take the, the right mix of ingredients in the right order, with the right set of conditions, you can cook a nice piece of pastry, I can make a ribonucleotide. And it came together in simple steps that could have taken place on their own on the early Earth. My team and I have recreated an early Earth scenario and let it run and the chemistry just does it on its own. But that wasn't all. They took their piece of RNA and subjected it to something else easy to come by on the early Earth. Light. Yes, sunlight. And so if you hit the switch, you'll see what happens when the sun shines. Something amazing happens. The light shining upon their sample turns some of the C bases, the bit that makes up the genetic code, into U's. So two for the price of one. Just by, just by having the sun shine. They had discovered a natural pathway to two of the four letters of RNA, letters that code for the proteins that build all living things. We were pretty happy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Understatement? Or? No, they were happy. I would never say the contrary, but in an English way. We might have had a trip to a local pub. <laughs> And so, while we're a long way from figuring out exactly how life got started... They've really, I think, solved one of the central hard questions in prebiotic chemistry. They filled in a piece of that mysterious underside to the tree of life. Because as we trace our origins by looking down, chemists like Sutherland are seeing things in a different way. What you see looking down from biology is what we see looking up from chemistry, and we can actually establish a link between the two. A pathway from simple to more complex chemicals until chemistry becomes biology. They've given us a glimpse 
of where we come from. Life existed on Earth for nearly four billion years before anything remotely resembling a human being showed up. And even then, when we started to branch off from other apes about 10 million years ago, our ancestors looked pretty different. For one thing, they were a lot hairier. Then, at some point, hair mostly disappeared from parts of our bodies and remained in a few others, including the head. Without body fur, we had to figure out how to make clothes to keep us warm. Since hair and clothes don't turn up much in the fossil record, figuring out when and why all this happened has stumped paleontologists. But recently, we discovered a witness to our hairy history. Correspondent Zaya Tong combed through the evidence to find the stealthy, diminutive creature who is now revealing some new clues to our origins and defining key steps on our path to being human. These little creatures might not be pretty, but scientists are just now discovering how much lice can reveal about our past. Presumably lice have been with us and evolving with us and adapting with us for as long as we have existed as a separate species and even before the origin of humans. Most parents are horrified to hear their child might have head lice. But when evolutionary biologist Mark Stone King got the news, he was just curious. My son came home from school with a note from a teacher saying that a child in his class had come to the class with lice. And in the pamphlet, there were some facts about lice. Two facts caught his eye. Head lice only live on the human scalp, and they cannot go more than a day without drinking our blood. But then when I actually started to look into this in more detail, I discovered that it was potentially even more interesting. Stone King discovered that the story of lice contains clues about our ancient history, dating all the way back to the dawn of humanity itself. Most of what we know about human evolution comes from these. The fossilized bones of our ancestors. With their help, we've traced our evolution from small furry creatures to the big brain beings we've become today. But bones can't tell us everything. One mystery that stumped the fossil hunters is when we started wearing clothes. We're not talking about these kinds of clothes, but something more basic. We don't have any direct evidence to answer the question when the first uh, clothing developed. And it's a very important question. Important because it'll help us get a handle on when we left Africa, our ancestral home, and spread out into colder regions. The earliest clues are bone-sewing needles dating as far back as 40,000 years ago. But we know early humans were world travelers long before that. Their fossil remains have been found across the globe. They were tropical creatures, and they had to adapt to this new environment. And it's really some kind of uh, puzzling question to figure out how they were able to cope with this kind of environment. At some point, our ancestors figured out how to bundle up. But when? Lice may hold the answer. It's really fascinating to me that we can use these parasites to study so many different aspects of human evolutionary history. Zaya, you are not going to believe the things we can learn. David Reed is now the world's foremost expert on the evolution of lice. He thinks the pest can solve all kinds of mysteries about our past, like when we started wearing clothes bringing me to a local strip mall in Florida to see if I've got what it takes to be a professional nitpicker. 
Zaya, this is Katie from Life Solutions. Good to meet you, Katie. Nice to meet you, too. And what's your name? Kylie. Hello, Kylie. So what are we going to be looking for today? We're going to see if Kylie has had lice. Katie is going to teach me to remove lice the age-old way, by hand. Initially, I like to part the hair here. See? Right there? Right there? OK. And then I just there go straight go. like that? You got that. it. Absolutely. Oh. That comes straight out, all the way out. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So I got you some samples. So what are we going to do with these guys? Well, we're going to take them back to the lab, and we're going to study their DNA. Back in the lab, Reed studies the DNA of not only the head louse, but also of this little guy, Pediculus humanus humanus, the body or clothing louse. To the naked eye, it looks identical to the head louse, but there are a few key differences. It lives and lays its eggs only in clothes and bedding, and unlike the head louse, the clothing louse can kill you. That it carries three different deadly diseases that have killed millions of humans over recent history. There are epidemic typhus, trench fever, and relapsing fever. Because of these diseases that they carry, they were partly responsible for absolutely decimating Napoleon's Grand Army through its famous winter march. As dangerous as they might be, for Reed, clothing lice are fascinating because they must have evolved from head lice. And they could only do that after we started wearing clothes. Clothing lice wouldn't have had a niche to live in until humans started wearing clothing. So if we can learn when they first started to emerge from head lice populations, we can learn when humans began to wear clothing for the first time. Reed set out to determine when the head louse and the clothing louse split into two separate species. To do that, he used a genetic dating technique called the molecular clock. Here's how it works. DNA is made out of a sequence of four chemicals known by their initials A, C, G, and T. A DNA sequence mutates or changes randomly, but at a known rate. DNA sequences change by mutations. And the idea behind the molecular clock is that those changes are occurring at more or less a constant rate over time. When Reed compared the DNA from modern clothing lice to human head lice, he discovered that the two species split over 170,000 years ago. And this, Reed says, is when we started to wear clothes. 170,000 years is important because that tells us that modern humans had the technology to use clothing while they were still in Africa. And that then allowed them to successfully colonize other parts of the world. Scientists believe that the invention of clothing in Africa was a key factor in allowing our ancestors to migrate into colder climates and to spread across the globe. The invention of clothing is just one of the mysteries that lice are helping to solve. They also hold crucial clues to the big event that made clothing necessary in the first place. The loss of our fur. The loss of body hair is interesting to anthropologists because it is a feature that distinguishes us from our nearest living relatives, chimpanzees. They have body hair, we don't. The problem is no one has been able to determine when our ancestors took this big evolutionary step. It turns out that the answer may lie with another kind of lice, even less welcome than head lice. The crab or pubic louse lives only in the human pubic region and has large claws designed to grab on to the thicker hair. We know pubic lice didn't evolve from head lice. They're a completely different species. So different, we must have caught them from another animal. Human pubic lice are more closely related to gorilla lice than they are to other human lice. Actually, scientists don't know exactly how lice jump from gorillas to our human ancestors. They speculate we may have eaten them or perhaps slept in their nests. But they do know that in order for crab lice to survive on our body, something had to give. We lost our body here. And that basically created, a, if you will, a geographical barrier between the pubic region and the head region that the lice could not cross. So both head lice and crab lice were able to thrive on our bodies thanks to this no lice land, the expanse of skin on our torso. So if we can figure out when crab lice appeared as a separate species, that should tell us when we started showing all that skin. To find the answer, David Reed compared the DNA of gorilla lice and human crab lice. He found that the two species split about three million years ago. And that's when David Reed believes we lost our body hair, 
when we were still small chimp-like creatures with few of the qualities we consider human. Most estimates don't go beyond a million years and suggest that we lost our hair around that time. These lice are telling us a very different story, that we might have lost our body hair as long as three million years ago. And that's a milestone in human evolution, because losing their fur enabled our ancestors to regulate their body heat by sweating more efficiently. Eventually, they could run long distances and hunt wild animals. The protein this provided was essential to the development of a big brain, the hallmark of becoming human. Piecing together the details of our human journey is a challenging task. It's ironic that some of the most mysterious gaps are being filled in by a creature we never really liked. We cannot neglect any piece of evidence. And if the lies teach us something, uh, it's very important. So we cannot neglect the lies. All humans, all living creatures, have common origins. But what about our individual origins, our own personal history? Where does that come from? Who you are, where you've been, and what you've done? It's all up here, captured and preserved in your memories. If you lost that, the story of your own origins, you'd lose your identity, your sense of self. In this episode's profile, we meet a researcher whose fascination with how memory and identity work led him to discover a chemical that has the power to erase memories and make our sense of where we come from disappear. As a new father, Andre Fenton loves capturing memories of his baby daughter Zora and wife Lisa. That's Zora's first Halloween. Andre thinks of all his memories as living in a dynamic set of file cabinets in his mind, where they're stored and add up to a life. Memory defines a person. My memories, in many ways, define me. As a neurobiologist at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn, Andre has become famous as the guy who, with a simple injection, can wipe away a memory forever. Scientists have thought it was impossible to erase a memory. So that was like a shock to the whole community. You can wipe out who you are, and that's an alarming thing. Andre's cutting edge ideas tap into our deepest hopes and fears, something we've seen in the movies. There's eternal sunshine of the spotless mind that deliberately investigates what would happen if you could erase painful, amorous memories. I'm erasing you and I'm happy! conclusion is it's not good. Except what Andre's doing is real. His fascination with the inner workings of the mind dates back to his childhood. Born in Guyana, Andre had to adapt to a strange new world at a young age. When I was six or seven, I moved to Toronto, Canada. What was essentially a new culture, so I learned to skate immediately. And at home, Andre had to cope with the tumultuous relationship between his mother and stepfather. They must have separated, I don't know, 10 times or so uh, during the course of their, their marriage. They were divorced twice. I have painful memories. And if you'd asked me right after my stepfather had packed his suitcase, would you like to get rid of this memory? The answer might probably have been yes. When I was in high school, I became deeply interested in understanding who are you in this world? What is the nature of my experience? At Montreal's McGill University, Andre searched for answers, 
He tried meditation and philosophy. Then a movie suggested that the key piece of this puzzle might lie inside his own head. I had seen altered states where a psychologist goes into a sensory deprivation tank and he has experiences that come from his brain and he's seduced by this. Beautiful. So Andre tracked down a sensory deprivation tank to try himself. And it was like instant meditation. And the thing that fascinated me was that my mind would construct images. I could move rather fast at times, like warp speed fast, and at other times very, very slowly. And there was nothing I was really experiencing that was outside of me. His time in the tank convinced Andre that to understand his experiences, he must first learn how the brain works. That's when he turned to neuroscience. One of the first challenges in the lab was to create a device that would force a rat to acquire a specific memory, a kind of memory-making machine. So Andre ran an electric current that would send a harmless shock whenever the rat entered the invisible triangle. In the future, the rat should remember to avoid this area. The device was called the Place Avoidance Task. But because Andre was only interested in spatial memory, he needed to make sure the rat was not cheating by using sight, sound, or smell to navigate the arena surface. To outsmart the rat, Andre began obsessively looking for a solution. Well, Andre is an incredible multitasker. You know, I think a typical moment with Andre is that he's walking the dog or in her baby Bjorn talking on a cell phone in a conference call and taking money out of the bank kind of all at the same time. But many of his best ideas surface in one unusual place. I spend a lot of time in the shower thinking about things, which my family is very unhappy about because we only have one shower. It's like a pieces of a puzzle that he needs to fit together, and he kind of works on it, works on it until it clicks. That's when he had a breakthrough with his memory-making machine. I let the rat step up onto my hands, which I kept just above the arena surface, and Benedetto physically turned the disc. And I let the rat crawl off my hand, and we watched to see where the rat avoided. By constantly rotating the floor, Andre had taken away all the clues for finding the shock zone. And that's how the rotating arena developed. Now Andre had a machine that could quickly create long-term spatial memories. But what to do with it? Enter Todd Sachter, a fellow neuroscientist whose lab, coincidentally, was just one story up from Andre at SUNY Downstate. Todd was one of many researchers struggling to discover the mechanisms the brain used to lock in some memories for a lifetime, while others faded away. Neuroscientists believed that a long-term memory occurred when a specific pattern of connections between a group of neurons were strengthened and maintained over time. After two decades of research, Todd suspected that many of those connections were maintained by a single enzyme in the brain called PKM Zeta. In a sense, I love PKM Zeta. The clearest way to demonstrate its power would be to block PKM Zeta and see if a long-term memory would be erased. So I walked down one flight into Andre's office, and he said, I think we're ready to find out if PKM Zeta is actually the mechanism for maintaining memories. So I said, Andre, what's the best task to test the hypothesis that PKM Zeta is important for maintaining long-term memory? Todd suggested several memory experiments to use with PKM Zeta, but Andre saw flaws in all of them. Then he suggested another apparatus. And I said, no, nope, I see this problem with that. He eventually said, what would you use? I said, well, I would use the place avoidance task. The experiment was simple. They placed a rat in the rotating arena and let it learn to avoid the shock zone. The nice thing about the place avoidance task is that where the rat goes gives you a pattern 
that looks like a scribble. When the rat is avoiding, it's a scribble that avoids a triangle. Once the rat consistently avoided the triangle, the memory had been learned. Then they injected a chemical which would stop PKM Zeta from working in the brain. If you inhibit PKM Zeta, then you should be able to erase a memory. Todd was sure it would work. I was certain it would not work. But once we injected the inhibitor, you could see that the rats went everywhere and the scribble just went all over the arena, like when the animals put there for the first time. The rat's memory of the shock zone was gone. With PKM Zeta disabled, the strength of the connections among the brain cells that formed the memory seemed to weaken. We came to the very simple conclusion. PKM Zeta is crucial for maintaining long-term memories, the kind that last forever, the kind that make you who you are. Todd came down with some sort of bubbly thing, sort of poured it around, and we cheered to that. Andre realized he was just scratching the surface of how PKM Zeta and long-term memory worked. But the press swarmed over the story of memory-erasing scientists in Brooklyn. Seeing Andre's face on the front page of the New York Times was a surprise to all of us. While Andre's experiment only applied to rats, his research touched on a darker current in the public psyche. I received emails from a variety of people who were interested in having their memories erased. I'm seeing therapists and psychiatrists two years now, but to no avail. If I, I could get a three-year amnesia somehow, I would do it in a minute. I would happily yes, trade in all my hard. memories, even the good ones, if it would erase this. I am living in hell and would try please, anything to please, leave. Please, please, keep me in mind if any clinical trial Sorry if I inconvenienced up. you in any way. I really did have a lot of accomplishments in life and had a lot of future potential. I really hope I never get to make the decision of whether we reboot a mind or not. I'm convinced that it's a bad idea. Imagine you're an adult person and you've spent a lot of time accumulating an identity. You might not like that identity, but the very notion that you could literally remove all of it, I don't know what you would be. I'm not sure you'd be human and I wouldn't know how to put it back. And now, for some final thoughts on where we came from. We only recently figured out the origin of our own moon. And we have some idea of how the sun and Earth formed. But that's only because modern telescopes empower us to see other stars and planets freshly hatched within gas clouds across the galaxy. As for the origin of life itself, the transition from inanimate molecules to what any of us would call life remains one of the great frontiers of biology. Since life on Earth is, so far, the only known example of life in the universe, our dilemma may simply be that we have no other examples to compare us with. If we did, then the life-non-life transition might look downright simple to us. No doubt the most challenging class of questions in science is the origin of things. So much of what we understand comes from knowing what something is and what that something used to be which allows us to figure out, or at least imagine, what happened in between. Okay, so where did it all come from? We're quite happy with our Big Bang description of cosmic origins, but actually, the Big Bang accounts for what happened only after the beginning. The beginning itself, and especially what happened before, remains the biggest mystery of all. Why? 
Because our universe is the only known example of a universe in the universe. And that is the Cosmic Perspective. And now we'd like to hear your perspective on this episode of Nova Science Now. Log on to our website and tell us what you think. You can watch any of these stories again, download additional audio and video, explore interactives, hear from experts, and watch revealing profiles from our web-only series, The Secret Life of Scientists and Engineers. Here's a sneak peek. Scientists have some amazing lives that you would never guess. I like to push limits. It is me, but to a big extreme. I play in a band called Harry and the Potters with my brother. Ice skating is nothing but applied Newtonian physics. I started cheerleading completely by accident. Fire it up! So if you're waving left, you must use your right hand. You don't want people to get a full view of your armpit. Never a pretty thing. i go with the Olympic gold medal, but only because there's no Nobel Prize for mechanical engineering. The butt glue. It's a special sort of glue that you apply to your rear end that actually holds your swimsuit in place. <laughs> I scare my undergrads with that. <laughs> Find it all on PBS.org. That's our show, and we'll see you next time. On Nova Science Now, what's the next big thing? Will our cars be so smart they drive themselves? I just press this button and it will come and pick me up. Can we power our cars with fuel grown in a field? Advanced biofuels. This is the future of energy for the U.S. And will intelligent machines take over the world? Don't worry. I'll keep you warm and safe in my people zoo. Next time on Nova Science Now. See a hidden side of science on NOVA's web-exclusive series, where we challenge experts to explain their work in less than 30 seconds. I'm a neuroscientist, and I work on two basic problems. One is, how does the brain store the experiences that you have as you go through the day? And the second is, how does the brain extract those experiences so that you can use those memories and that information judiciously to get through the day? And in particular, how do you organize your thoughts? That's the subject that I work on. <laughs> this Nova Science Now program is available on DVD at shoppbs.org.